Hello, my name is Linda Nicklin and today I'm talking with Jack Mann, author of Gravity's Arrow, which was published in 2019. So, hi Jack, could you start by telling me what you got in, into, what got you into writing? What right, well thank you very much for this. Um, I got into writing or I was inspired to write a book from as early as six years old when my parents kept talking about Lord of the Rings and I got it in my head at that age that I would write the sequel to Lord of the Rings. Obviously that never happened, but uh, throughout primary school, I always loved creative writing sessions and would like to try and shock my friends with stories about punks with chainsaws for hands and dangerous biker gangs of grandmas and that sort of thing. And then throughout my secondary school, I also kept having attempts to write novels as well. Uh, and then in my gap year, I got so far. And then finally, thanks to fantastic books, uh, I've managed to produce this book, which I'm really proud of. It's, it's, it's a book, I suppose, I've written it mostly for myself. Uh, but the idea that other people are enjoying it is really nice. And I know that people are enjoying it. And, uh, and now, of course, as we'll talk later, um, we're releasing a special edition as well. But it's always been something I've wanted to do, and I'm really happy to have managed to do so now. Okay. So tell me, how do you approach writing? How do you, how do you approach it? So historically, when I was younger, I remember one of the problems I had was that, I mean, I suppose more so as a teenager, I'd have an idea in my head that I really liked. And when I think back to those ideas, I still think they're quite good. But... I would start writing and the fact that I knew the end of the book or the story would, I guess, kill my enthusiasm to continue working on it. So then during my gap year, I experimented with writing without really planning far ahead at all. And I actually wrote a lot more that way, but then I managed to write myself into plot holes and scenarios where it didn't really make sense. So I spent, quite a few years of medical school and my early years as a junior doctor, planning the sort of universe that I could write the story I would want to write into. And the issues I had run into before were along the lines of, well, I wanted to write science fiction and I wanted it to feel sort of fantasy-like, or more importantly, I wanted the choices and sacrifices of the people in the story to be meaningful. I didn't want it to be like, you know, Ian and Banks, Ian and Banks is great, but I didn't want, I didn't like the idea that there were these ships that had minds that were kind of deciding everything for us and we were sort of pathetic bystanders in, in the big scheme of things. And that may be the future that, you know, we have in, in our future of this, this uh, our race that we are just dominated by our robot, robot overlords in the end. But I'd, I'd like to think otherwise. And also my story, didn't, I didn't want that to be like that. So I spent a long time developing a, a world with rules that enabled this to be the case. And once I had developed this universe um, and the rules around it that were I could be consistent with, I then kind of outlined the plot and the most important parts of it, and then wrote, then almost kind of off the cuff, but with some pointers as to where I'd go at the end and here and there in the middle of the story, I sort of just wrote for five to six weeks a first draft of the story during a, um, uh, and, uh, and, and then in that time, the, the story kind of made itself, as it were, which is really nice. However, having done that, and it's been successful for this book, I've been planning my sequels, and the sequels, it's going to be three books that are linked to each other, and because of the plot twists and, and events that I plan to tie into that, which all have to make sense again, I've been much more sort of methodical about planning the sequels and trying to work them out quite well in advance about what events happens when and how so that it will all make sense in the end. So I guess my writing style or method of writing does seem to be evolving still but uh, I suppose as long as I don't lose interest which was the original problem that's fine and, and so far I remain very, I remain very ex excited about my sequel so that, that's looking fine. So Jack can you tell me about the way that you created the detail in your world and I'm particularly interested in your lack of electronics and use of crystals how did that that come about so yeah i was really interested in the idea of a world where the choices and sacrifices of the characters were more meaningful and meant something and therefore i set about designing a world where that could happen and the 
and therefore I had to find a way to sort of get rid of electronics or artificial intelligence, um, but still allow it to be a science fiction book and try and make it something that could be kind of consistently, uh, rules that were consistent within the story at least. And I hoped that at some stage I might be able to, you know, come up with a more clearer justification of how that, how this universe might work. But as long as it was internally consistent, I figured that would be possible and pending a really, really concrete, agreed universal theory of everything, I figured that, you know, this would be fine to work with um, in such a fashion. So I came up with the idea of these crystals, which were discovered by mankind in our future, but long ago in the past of the story. And the crystals allow faster than light travel, but they interfere with electronic devices. So you can't have artificial intelligence, you can't have uh, electronic machines. Um, you, can have all, you can have all those things a long way away from where people are using the crystals, and therefore there is artificial intelligence in the universe, which is doing things like genetically engineering dragons and, and stuff like that, and other strange animals. And then those dragons and animals are being used day to day by the characters in the story, giving it a sort of fantasy feel. But you don't have, you know, Ian M. Banks is great, but you don't have mines and knife missiles basically deciding what happens in the story. You have the people and their choices and sacrifices making the difference as the story goes along. And it, I guess it makes it more relatable to me as a human being and not an artificial intelligence robot. Um, and I suppose I wanted to write a story that really appealed to me. Uh, obviously, I'd love it. I would love the idea of appealing to other people. And so far, I've had lots of good feedback and people are really enjoying it. But, but I knew, I guess I know what I like and I know that that sort of thing is the sort of thing that I like. And then in terms of the rest of it, like coming up with settings and scenes and what happens and, and the rest of the details of the world itself. I, I don't struggle to imagine things. I, I just find imagining something that fits with the rest of the story and doesn't contradict itself and other important things. And also that is plausible within the rules of the story I'm telling. That's the tricky bit. So I might come up with all kinds of ideas that I dismiss, that I dismiss and don't use. Uh, it, it's almost like that. I think it's a bit like trial and error. I'll come up with an idea, plant it on the story, see if it works, dismiss it, and work through like that. I think that's probably how my mind works. I don't, uh, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the theoretical approach where you put things in, try them, trial and error, kind of a little bit like your work, really. Yeah, well, like lots of things, like a lot of things. I think yeah. trial and error. I will, um, I'm not saying uh, what you do is not trial and error. I'm just saying that that kind of yeah. problem-solving approach. Yeah, yeah. I've got to be careful about saying I do trial and error at work when I'm a oh, doctor. No, no, yeah. I didn't mean that. But you know what I mean. Yeah. So, so approach. Does that work? Uh, no. Yeah. Yes. I guess you imagine it, don't you? Yeah. 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 So I'd imagine what would happen and and uh, and see if it fits with the story and then apply it or not apply it and and that's how I come up with lots of the ideas, yeah. I've just cut a whole thread out of my book, and that's made such a difference. Oh. It's, it's freed me up completely. I got myself into a, a total <laughs> dead end, which Interesting. That's, that's what you do, isn't it? Yeah. So you, you mentioned uh, previously to me about how you found working with uh, writing groups and how you use people as beta readers and so on. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Yes. So after I wrote the first draft of the book, I sent it to close family and friends, and I got lots of useful feedback. I remember one of my cousins uh, commented that there needed to be more strong female characters, and, and I looked at the book and considered that that was a valid criticism. And, and I guess being an author, one of the things about that is you are sort of god of your story and it's quite easy to gender reassign people as needed uh, so a lot of ambassadors and um, and generals and ad admirals suddenly became women because it, it felt appropriate and then uh, also I guess the main character's mother and his sister were their sort of relevance of the story was increased and but then after that still you know one can expect more positive feedback from people close to you uh, so I went about seeking more objective feedback from writing groups, and this was really useful. I think it's really important to be able to hear the negative feedback and consider it properly and not be upset by it. Obviously, 
uh, if feedback can be fed back in the feedback sandwich of you know some good feedback and then some negative and then some not so good feedback, it's easier to swallow. But you know some people don't do it like that; they'll just hit you with the bad things, <laughs> and uh, but that's fine. And then and and it, and it's important to listen to it and consider it and and then sometimes not you know take on board all of it you know because uh, some of it just because one person likes one thing one way it doesn't mean it's right for your book or, or the audience you're aiming for and it's just as long as one is being as objective as possible and really trying to imagine what they're getting at when they give you the negative feedback uh, it's a really worthwhile experience uh, a worthwhile thing to do and one example of a writing group experience i had was i took the book to one writing group at easter con uh, so it's a big you know science fiction literary convention and they critiqued the book and they were really positive about it but they also said that the prologue much as they liked it they felt that it wasn't necessary and that i ought to remove it so i removed it and then after a year or two took it to another writing group and that writing group didn't get it. They, they, they read the first chapter in, in isolation without the prologue. And because the first chapter focuses on a laboratory where the characters, you know, something happens, and then they got very involved and uh, attached to the laboratory as they read the first chapter. And then at the end of the first chapter, I destroyed the laboratory anyway. And then they all got a bit upset by that. And I think the prologue reduce the risk of those sorts of emotional responses because the prologue gave a kind of more galactic feel to the story it gave a bigger sort of uh it it gave more of a, a sense that the setting was not just going to be one single place it was a a big epic sort of story not not um one boy in his life in this laboratory so i put the prologue back in um uh, because of that um but yeah i mean one of my writing groups was really useful we were meeting on a monthly basis sharing 10,000 words of our stories every month. And that was really, really invaluable. So, um, yeah, I've, I've made lots of people write from this, actually, uh, to be honest, doing this. Mm, yeah. It's good to have different kinds of uh, reading groups, isn't it? Because mm. obviously one of your groups was more skilled in reading your, your type of story. Yes. And so they didn't need the prologue. Yeah. But others did. So it gives you a broader sense of your readership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Write it, you know. So, um, yeah. So, when do you expect your sequel to be released? Oh, right. So the sequels. Oh, yeah. So, so with regards to the sequels, I have, as I mentioned, I've been I've planned them out more carefully. They are set about twelve years after the first book, and it's three books which will be tied together, but sort of standalone as well. Each one. But it, it is a trilogy. The story does go from one book to the next. And it's when Firo um, is, um, he's, he's, old, he's now, like in Roman times, he's embarking on a sort of military political career. Uh, the society he lives in is a bit like that. And at the same time, there is a war going on between the empire he lives in and the Credate, who were the sort of enemy empire from the first book. And he, uh, and so that's ongoing. But also his friend has been murdered and there's an element of you know unraveling the mystery around his friend's death which he and his other friends are trying to figure out throughout the whole um three book series if you like so uh and in terms of when this will come out and i'm well i mean i'm really excited about it i'm really enjoying writing it i know what's going to happen but in a way that you know, hasn't stopped me from getting engrossed in it um i suppose i'll need to write the books and get them and then and then start doing my feedback session with writing groups and such like before I get involved with editors uh, but it does depend on, on how how um, how fast I can get it out really I, I'm not I can't I can't comment just yet I need to write the first draft I think first um, get a sense of how complete they are so having read uh, Grammar Tower I'm looking forward to the sequel but you're going to bring out a special edition aren't you so do you want to tell us a little bit about that yes yes so we're releasing a special edition of Gravity's Arrow um, quite soon, uh, end of October uh, 2020. And the reasons behind the special edition are that the science behind the universe that enabled you know, this business about crystals, uh, I was talking to um, some, a work colleague whose brother had done a PhD in theoretical physics, and we started coming up with theoretical explanations for how this could even happen which you know which, which is really exciting and the 
special edition includes details in a letter from one character to another character about how crystals work and how they interact with electronics and that sort of thing. Um, the other, the, some of that detail is incidentally available on my website, www.gravitiesarrow.com, uh, as is the glossary, which is also in the book. But the website versions are not quite the same as the ones in the book. So the book is more updated, actually, and the book uh, detail on the site is also more up to date and written in a nicer way as well. Uh, so the um, glossary is important because there, I mean, I guess I wrote the book for myself primarily, and so there are quite a lot of characters in it. And I think it is useful to have something like that just to keep track of people. And some people have fed back that it would have been, would have been useful to have a glossary. So that's also part of the special edition. Yeah, I do love a book with a glossary and a who's who. Yeah. And our cast I think I do. Too. I think you can relax then because you don't have to remember who's who because you know that yeah. you can find it. It's a much nicer read. You can focus on the story rather than the who is yeah. this. And that. Tell me about how you managed to fit writing into your busy life. I know it's so busy. Well, yeah, so. I, I do have a, a job. I'm a doctor, and I have three kids, and 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 I try to stay healthy. So I'm I'm very busy, but I guess I'm I'm very very I'm really excited about writing. I enjoy it, and so I make it happen. So even on the tube, uh, I'll I'll be writing. Um, I've got a little laptop that I take with me. I just open it up whenever I get a chance, and start typing. And if I take the kids to a class or something, I'll I'll sit on the side writing. <laughs> and if I uh, and if I wake up early, I'll do some writing, and I just have to, I just find the time. The first book I originally wrote the first draft when I was um, before kids came along, and in fact, a little bit of a story here. So, I, as a junior doctor, I, I one oh, in this country or when I was training, one did four years as a very junior doctor, and then the next stage of training is called registrar training, and before. My, there was a gap of two months between the end of my junior doctor job and the start of my registrar job. It wasn't that I, there was anything I'd done wrong or anything. It was just like there was a gap that just happened to be there between those two posts. And uh, and so I spoke to my consultant tutor sort of person, and uh, Dr. Carby, and said, oh, look, I've got these two months. I guess I should go get some locum work. And, and he said, what are you doing? You'll never get two months off work like this again. <laughs> Do something with your life. And I thought, oh, yes, good point. Of course, I was planning to write this novel for the last, you know, up two years. So I just used that two months to really smash out the first draft of the novel. And uh, and that really helped because then I had a sense of it. It, really, it was alive, you know, even if it was nowhere near ready. It had a life of its own. It, it was something in my heart that I could then continue to work on. And I did spend many, many years editing. I was lucky enough to be working in a place that was a fair commute to where, so it wasn't lucky in that sense, but it was a commute away, but it required, it was a commute on a train that was very uh, empty. So I got to take my laptop to work and type away all the way an hour there and an hour back. So I got lots of work and editing done that way too. So nowadays the time is tighter by a long way because of the kids and because the commute is not quite as uh, lengthy, but I still get stuff done. Um, ironically, lockdown means the tubes are less packed, so I do get a seat so I can actually <laughs> write something on the way to and from work. I guess I've got to take the good things when they come from this bizarre situation we're living in uh, now. But um, yeah. So I'm going to pin you down now, Jack. Tell me about your website. All right. So I have made a website, www.gravitiesarrow.com, and uh, there are obviously links to the book on there and there's the artwork. So Raymond Marritt uh, made an amazing front cover for the book, and he's also I also commissioned him to make some further artwork, which is on the website. Uh, that depicts certain scenes in the book. I don't think they spoil too much, so you can look at them without spoiling the story, and that's okay, uh, but they're really good. Uh, and then um, the other website also incl will include details of the release of the special edition, and the, uh, there's also, we're planning a promotion of the original edition too, and I'll put some details of the sequels on there as well. And, and anything else, the law. So it's got a lot of detail on the scientific basis behind Gravity's Arrow. So the special edition book has it in a different format in a way that I really like it. Um, in fact, it was one of the guys I was working with to come up with the special edition scientific basis who suggested I write it as a letter from one character to another. And I think that's worked really well. 
So at the start, the boy has a one of his sort of tutors, the, the scientist he's working with. Um, the idea is he's written a letter to the main character, which the main character doesn't discover until the end of the story, which is actually plausible based on the kind of chaotic things that go on between the, the start and the end of the book. And uh, the website has it in more of a dry format, just sort of stating a lot of facts. And not even everything that's in the special edition is in the website, but um, uh, but it's still it's, it's a good source of information on that. And uh, and yeah, and I plan to keep updating it, and then it's fun to, to stay on top of. Excellent, sounds wonderful. I'll have a look. Can you give us the um, address again? Yeah, www.gravities, arrow, G R A V I T Y S A R R O W dot com. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. That, that was no great. worries. Um, I look forward to it. I'm going to go and have a look uh, shortly after I walk my dog because that was what all our noises about. <laughs> okay. <laughs>